Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special symposium on the Latinx vote in 2020. My name is Bill Johnson Gonzalez, and I'm the director of the Center for Latino Research at DePaul. It's my pleasure to welcome our panelists for today, Professor Melissa Michelson of Menlo College and LULAC Iowa State Director Nick Salazar, and of course, our own esteemed colleague, Dr. Joe Tafoya of the Department of Political Science at DePaul. We really appreciate all of you joining us in this virtual space, and we're looking forward to your comments. Before we begin, I just want to say some special thank yous to people who made this event happen today. In addition, of course, to our guests and our panelists, I want to thank Alejandra Delgadillo, uh, the program assistant for the Center for Latino Research, uh, who is behind the scenes today helping us with technology stuff, but also has been helping us all along put the event together. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Office of Global Engagement, the Center for Black Diaspora, the Departments of Political Science, African Black Diaspora Studies, Latin American and Latino Studies, History, and the Critical Ethnic Studies Program. We are fast approaching what in the eyes of many seems to be one of the most historically important elections for the President of the United States. In this election season, the Latinx community has become the focus of attention for many commentators, as some wonder whether Latinx voters will function as a swing vote to help the Democratic nominee, while some others have wondered why there hasn't been more of an aggressive attempt on the part of the Democratic Party to mobilize the Latinx vote, especially given concerns about how difficult it may be to vote during the COVID pandemic. Meanwhile, Despite the current president's explicitly derogatory comments about Mexicans, his aggressive anti-immigration policies, and poor behavior after natural disasters in Puerto Rico, many news sources are still reporting that Donald Trump commands a sizable proportion of the Latinx vote. I hope our conversation today will shed some light on these urgent and important questions. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Joe Tafoya. Hi there, thank you very much, Billy. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to everyone. Welcome to my classes uh, that are in attendance as well. Um, hi there, I'm Professor Joe Tafoya. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy with the audience is here and I'm really happy that our guests are here. Uh, we're gathered here to discuss the Latinx vote ahead of this very important election with the recent presidential debate reminding us of the very high stakes. We come with you with special attention to the Latino vote because of its potential to influence the election in places that are battleground states, such as Florida and Pennsylvania, and even in new places like Texas, where the difference in support between President Trump and former Vice President Biden is within the margin of error. Despite this potential, the problem before us is that the Latino community is drastically undermobilized. Recently, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, NALEO, reported that less than half of registered Latino voters have been contacted to vote for the election. And political strategists have started jumping in. The Lincoln Project held a town hall last night featuring its new bipartisan alliance and vigorous campaign ads costing millions of dollars aimed at Latino voters and in opposition of President Trump. Whether this can work remains to be seen. To discuss this topic of Latino voter mobilization, I'm accompanied by Professor Melissa Michelson and Nick Salazar Professor Michelson comes to us from Menlo College and is a widely cited author of field experiments on Latino voter mobilization techniques that include door-to-door -door canvassing and ethnic appeals. Nick Salazar is the state director of uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens of Iowa former, and former Bernie 2020 Iowa co-chair. He headed the Iowa Civic Education Campaign that mobilized Latinx as the head of the Iowa caucuses earlier this year. Lastly, I'm accompanied by you, our audience, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will get to them at the end of our discussion. So to start without further ado, to start our discussion, I'd like to begin with Professor Michelson, Professor Melissa Michelson. Um, let's start a little bit, um, let's start from the beginning to hear a little bit about your work on Latino mobilization and its genesis. Sure. So um, I finished graduate school in the early 1990s, right when Prop 187 was happening, when there was uh, national policies being passed that were anti-Latino, anti-immigrant, and that's the core kind of work I was focused on at the time, um, studying attitudes um, 
and political trust, political efficacy. Um, but then um, in 2000, um, some of you might be familiar with the groundbreaking work done by Don Green and Alan Gerber out of Yale University, where they did a randomized controlled trial to get out the vote in Connecticut. And they launched this subfield of get out the vote research using experimental methods. Well, Don Green had been my dissertation advisor, and I was actually in Chicago for the Midwest Political Science Association. And I ran into him in, on the sidewalk outside of the Palmer House, and he said, hey, Melissa, I just did this cool experiment. You should do one for Latinos. And I said, uh, OK. He said, I'll give you money. And I said, OK. <laughs> so he subgranted me $40,000 from a grant he had received. And I used that money to take 40 of my students from Cal State Fresno out to the local farming town of Dos Palos, California. And we canvassed for two weekends, trying to get um, the residents of this majority Latino town to vote in their school board election in November 2001. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really worked. It was a huge success. The students had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. Um, and we showed that uh, if you went door to door with a bunch mm -hmm. of bilingual Mexican American students, you could in fact increase Latino turnout, even for this sleepy little school board election that, you know, obviously the incumbents were going to win and this uh, fairly unusual challenger wasn't going to win a seat, but it was just about showing up. Uh, and so that really launched that aspect of my research where, you know, once I had done it once, now I was like, well, what now what if we do this? And what if we do this? And I did uh, multiple experiments in Fresno. Um, usually in cooperation with my students, using them to do the canvassing. Then I started working with community organizations. Um, I just really haven't stopped now for 20 years um, doing more and more experiments, um, more often now in cooperation with community organizations, finding better and um, more cost-effective ways to get out the Latinx vote. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, the Latino population has increased in size in the last few decades. How has this uh, influenced your work? Well, one way it's influenced it is that more and more people are interested, right? Um, and it means that we're doing the work in a lot of different places. So, you know, it's not just California, but now I'm doing experiments with groups in Virginia and North Carolina and, right, and all over the country because it, of course, turns out that there are Latinx voters in every state in the country, but then that you can get into the nuances of well, what's different about doing a get out the vote experiment in California versus doing one in Virginia, right? If it works in New Jersey, does it work the same in Texas? And so it's, um, it has brought a lot more interest, a lot more money, um, and also allowed us to really learn a lot more about how to micro target and how to reach out effectively to different types of Latinx potential voters. Have you seen that the, um, and I'm just kind of curious here, have you seen that the political campaigns have adopted some of this work, some of this research to, um, to empower their own uh, voter mobilization strategy? Oh yeah, um, it's one of the more gratifying aspects of my work, to be honest, is, you know, I, I'm not just an academic writing papers and books that like five people read and like we all pat each other on the back like, oh yeah, I read your book. Um, but that my work is picked up by quote unquote real people. Um, I get phone calls from campaigns, I get phone calls from candidates, I get emails, um, and I can see, even if they haven't reached out to me directly, I can see when the work is having an impact. So um, all of my work is nonpartisan and I, I do work with a number of nonprofit community organizations and I'm actively engaged in getting out the vote this year as in many other years. But you can also see it in the partisan campaigns um, that they're learning from this work too, like they're, they're reading it, right? Uh, even if they don't always get the nuances of it, right? Sometimes you're like, mm, dude, read the appendix. Um, but it's actually pretty exciting when you see that the scholarship that you're producing for what is usually a pretty small audience is impacting the real world. And real quick, what is it about Latino voters that makes them so amenable to being uh, mobilized? Being, being invited to, to vote? Well, I don't know that Latinx voters are, are special in that way. I think everyone just 
likes to be asked, right? Like to be appreciated, like to feel valuable. And so what had, had been happening and, and, and still does happen really quite a bit um, is that nobody's asking, nobody's reaching out to their votes. Nobody's actively telling them, hey, your voice is important here. Make sure you show up and you vote. Um, so just like anybody else, Latinx folks are amenable to get out the vote appeals because like everyone else, they like being asked. They like being invited in. Mm -hmm. Historically, they've been excluded. Now more and more as more people appreciate like, hey, Latinx voters could really decide this thing. Mm -hmm. Now they're getting more, a little bit more love. That's amazing work. And I'm really happy that we have Nick Salazar here with us because he is a person who has been on the field out in Iowa doing the ask, right? Asking Latino voters to actually, Latinx voters to come to, to, to the political club and, 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 and vote. Um, uh, so Nick, um, I'm, I'm curious about your perspective, your perspective out in the field um, to see if you know, some of this maps on accurately. Um, how did you end up working for the Sanders campaign and as director for ULAC in Iowa? Thank you, Joe and uh, <laughs> Bill uh, for putting on this great event. Uh, such an important event with the the election coming up and with all these questions about what's going on uh, in our community. Um, I'm from Iowa. I was born and raised in Muscatine. Um, my family is from Texas. Um, their family is from Mexico. Um, so I, I grew up here in Iowa and um, I've been doing a lot of work uh, for the last 10-15 years, uh, doing a lot of community organizing, a lot of immig uh, advocating for immigrants, advocating for workers' rights, uh, in the Latino community, just really anything I can do to empower uh, and inspire members of the uh, community. I really started getting more active uh, around 2015 uh, when Bernie Sanders announced his uh, presidential bid um, that year, the, the first time around. And so I got more active politically uh, in the community um, and was looking for an organization that I could really have a platform to, to do this work. Um, and I learned about LULAC. Uh, I joined the organization. Uh, LULAC, if you don't know, uh, is the League of United, Latin America, uh, United Citizens of America. Um, it's the oldest uh, and largest Latino civil rights organization uh, in the country. And the mission is to advance the, uh, the educational attainment, uh, the economic condition, uh, health, housing, political influence, and the civil rights of Latinos across the United States and in uh, Puerto Rico. Here in Iowa, LULAC has been here uh, since 1957 uh, when it chartered its first council uh, in a little town called Fort Madison, uh, Southeast Iowa. Um, so Latinos, when people think about Iowa or even anywhere in the Midwest, they, they think about mainly white people, mainly rural farmers. Um, but the reality is we have huge communities um, in, in, in many of these uh, areas across the state uh, and across the Midwest. And so what we wanted to do with our growing population, um, and it's um, growing very fast here in Iowa, we wanna make sure that our community is ready uh, to vote and be engaged into the process. And so uh, we started doing that, uh, planning that campaign. Um, and then I became the, the state director a little bit over a year ago. Um, it feels like two years, um, mm -hmm. but um, it's been a lot of great work. And one of the very first things that we were doing uh, was playing in this amb ambitious civic engagement campaign. Um, right. And on the, the, the Sanders campaign part, um, Senator Sanders, uh, I've been communicating and working with the campaign since 2016. Um, and fortunately, um, and I'm honored to, you know, to have been tapped as the uh, campaign co-chair uh, to help out the campaign and bridge some of these gaps uh, in the electoral process. Um, I'm curious about the presence of Latinos in Iowa. Did the organization feel that Latinos were under mobilized? Um, how did they come to um, how did they come to devote the resources right to mobilizing Latinos? And what were your, what were the potentials that they wanted to tap? Yeah, so uh, we're basically the only major Latino organization um, in the state of Iowa. And unfortunately, in the absence of um, some of the work the state party and the national party and a lot of the campaigns aren't doing, uh, we, have to, we have to step in um, and bridge many of those gaps. Um, as we were talking about earlier, um, a lot of these campaigns aren't reaching out to um, 
Latino voters. And here in the state of Iowa, we have uh, 50, we have 60,000 registered Latino voters. Uh, we have about 90,000 who are eligible to vote. Um, and our state population is, is almost 200,000, which is expected to double within the next 25 uh, to 30 years. And so this is a huge opportunity and we just wanna make sure that the community uh, is prepared to be active uh, civically uh, in the absence of some of the campaigns and uh, party work. And real quick, what were some of the strategies that the, um, that, that the campaign for LULAC utilized, right? To, to go after the uh, Latino population there? Yeah, so the Iowa caucuses, we were fortunate because they start a year before the actual caucus. So a lot of the uh, campaign activity um, has been going on all year, all year long. So we had the opportunity to do many uh, uh, strategies and many uh, tactics, and it's really nothing too exotic. Um, we're just talking about knocking on doors. We're talking about having these intimate conversations with our neighbors about the issues. Um, and a lot of it is cultur uh, culturally integrated. So we're not just having um, you know, uh, we're not written out a building and having this event. We're going to the fiestas that are already happening. Uh, we're already going to the pasadas that are already going on. Uh, we're going to the churches, the loterias, or wherever the community is at. Um, that's where uh, we were going to engage um, uh, with, with the members. That's excellent. Thank you for your response to that question. And it dovetails on, on my following question. Um, does it work to just put Latino kids in Latino neighborhoods doing this kind of work or having Latinos make phone calls and send mailer? Does it work to do? Does it, does it work? It to works. Do? It works, but not, it's not ideal, right? So I, I talked about how for my first Latinx get out the vote experiment, I took students from Fresno State and we drove an hour and we went to Dos Palos. That worked, but in subsequent work, we've learned that it'd be better if we had had some students from Dos Palos, right? If we had had local people doing it. Um, when, you when you use local people, they are more effective. Um, it leads to more doors being opened because uh, they're members of the community and, and so they can make the initial contact. Um, they can build on those existing relationships, right? There's kind of more of this cultural competency that, that Nick alluded to, right? So using neighbors is more effective, but that doesn't mean that shipping in people from another state doesn't work, just not as good, right? Uh, people in California always ask me like, should I go to Nevada? Should I make phone calls in Arizona? Like, does that really work? And I say, sure. It's not as good as if you were from Arizona, but mm -hmm. yeah, go, go, go help. Um, so, you know, there's degrees, there's a degrees of effectiveness. I remember one of my fondest memories of working with you, Melissa, um, was when we were uh, putting together a phone bank to mobilize voters in East Los Angeles. And one of the things that we wanted to, to make sure that we got down was that the, the phones that we were calling out of were from the same area code, which I think was 323, because people were more likely to answer. And it helped that there was a, there was a voice like them. It sounded like them on the other, the other line. Um, yeah, that stuff is great. Um, yeah, and I'm also and I'm also reminded of what um, of what Nick is talking about. I saw um, a couple of webinars by Chuck Borcha, um, who's describing a lot of voter mobilization work. Um, he's talking about how um, we tend to overthink. You know, we tend to overthink it, right? Just making the ask um, is simple enough in, in most in most cases. Um, do you have any experience any experience with this, uh, Nick? Yeah, and I, I agree that. Um, the the, the calling and the mailers do work to a certain degree. It just depends on how much of an investment uh, these campaigns um, want to put into that. And that depends on the language, the issues, and the timing. Um, for example, in Iowa, the very first piece of literature that was sent out in the state by the Sanders campaign was in April of 2019, and it was a bilingual a uh, piece of literature that was geared towards um, the Latino community. And I actually do have it uh, right here with me. And this is actually, it has me, my wife and the Senator, which was the very first piece of lit that, that went out. And it just has the basic stuff. And when we're talking about the language and the issues, um, nothing, you know, not a lot of Hispanic going on here, just talks about 
taking on powerful special interests, talks about Medicare for all. And then on the back of the lit, it talks about uh, Bernie's immigration story, which I'm sure we've all heard and which I think really made that connection. And so I think when we take the time, uh, you know, to send these out early enough and we have the, the right language and, uh, and like we talked about earlier was uh, having the right people in the community. So as LULAG, we were able to find folks from within these communities to talk about the issues that are even more relevant to the locals uh, in those communities. Mm -hmm. What was uh, LULAG's campaign like um, in terms of mailers, in terms of the information that they were using to outreach, outreach folks? So LULAC's approach was a more of a nonpartisan um, approach. So what um, so what we ended up doing was sending out our own mailers. Uh, we made a lot of phone calls and we were registering voters. Um, that was really the front end of that campaign. We were able to raise $100,000 to really get this going. Um, we hired about 10 people to knock on doors. We knocked on about 12,000 doors in the state of Iowa. We ended up registering 5,000 voters, um, but it was still, I mean, even with that, there was still a lot of uh, barriers because, you know, we're always at work, we're always busy. For some reason, we just don't seem to, we don't tend to open up the door a lot um, when people are knocking um, as well, but it was really just the basic stuff. We even had uh, the first ever LULAC National uh, Town Hall in Des Moines, and it was around October, where we had about 1,200 Latinos show up to hear about the issues um, uh, about the, the campaigns that are running. And we had uh, Bernie showed up, Julian Castro showed up, uh, showed up uh, Beto O'Rourke showed up. And really what our goal was is just to make sure the community is in position for these campaigns to come in and engage with them. Um, and that is what we did. Excellent, thank you very much for that response. Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, um, so it seems like there's a lot of work that's happening right, in mobilizing the Latino community. Um, and you've described how the Bernie Sanders campaign did, did a good deal of it and Lulek was doing it in a bipartisan manner. Um, who should be shouldering this work? Um, why isn't it happening in a more systematic way? Um, are the political parties, for example, should they be doing this? Are they not doing it as much? Um, should it stick with nonprofit organizations? What, what perspectives can two of you share with us? Yeah, I think, I think it really depends on the campaign. So if, if we have a campaign that isn't doing a lot of investments into the community. And I mean, putting hiring a Latinx uh, folks up and down the campaign structure. Um, but if they're not doing that, if they're not hiring a lot of folks, so a lot of these other campaigns would have one you know, Latino organizer per every 25,000 people. That when the campaigns don't make that investment to give them the help that they need on the ground, that burden falls on that organizer and everybody else in the community who is volunteering uh, to help. So, which is why it's very important to uh, make those investments and get the right people um, to, to do that in those communities. Melissa? I, th I think campaigns put in the investment when they think it will matter. I mean, just look at how much attention and how much love Latinx voters in Florida get. Um, and we're seeing, you know, maybe renewed appreciation for Latinx voters in other states this year. Um, but, you know, they're, they're not so much worried about maximizing the power of the Latinx community or making sure the Latinx community has a vote. They, they want to win. And if winning means, you know, what we really need to do is we need to reach out to those folks those white folks in the suburbs in Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota and Pennsylvania, that's what we need to focus on, then that's where the money's going to go. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, there's, there's not usually a lot of investment uh, by political parties, especially like for a presidential election in Latinx communities. And the work is shouldered by community organizations like Naleo, um, other, many other groups, right? There's a lot of groups out there doing this work, working really hard to get out the Latinx vote, but it's not the national political parties because they're trying to win the Rust Belt, you know, and maybe Florida. And so, you know, you can't blame them. They only have so much time and so much money and their number one priority is to win. And if Latinx folks don't have a history of voting 
aren't likely voters. And it was so close in Wisconsin and in Pennsylvania, right? That's where they're going to put their effort. So as frustrating as it is, right? And as much as we'd like to see that everybody's vote is as important and is as coveted and as, you know, sought, as long as we have an electoral college, we're going to have this focus on white suburban voters by the national parties. And if the Latinx community wants a voice, it's up to them and their community organizations really to demand it. Right. That seems to place a, yeah, quite a bit of burden on, on nonprofit organizations to do a lot of this work on nonpartisan organizations. Um, and every now and then I do hear um, of, of the, the campaign making the best for providing money to them to, to, help, to help out do this kind of work. Um, I was going to ask, uh, and this already probably been answered, but what could campaigns be doing better now? What could some of these nonprofit organizations be doing better now to mobilize uh, Latino voters in, in places that matter? Yeah, the, the research is out there. It's really just a, a question of the commitment of funds, right? I've been doing this work since 2001. Many other scholars have also been doing this work. So if you want to know how to get that Latinx vote, scholars can tell you, right? The knowledge is there, mm -hmm. but it would cost, you know, $4 billion to get out every Latinx voter in America. And mm -hmm. nobody's going to give us that $4 billion, right? So uh, we, know what, we know what it costs. We know how to do it. But that's a lot of money. And maybe that... Exciting, uh, real quickly, what are some exciting uh, things from the literature that are coming up that, that you, you know, if you had all the money, you, you might try? Yeah, well, there's some really cool stuff going on in terms of digital organizing that a number of groups have been experimenting with since the spring. So as, it, uh, as we got into the later primaries and primaries were canceled um, and we were switching to vote by mail, a lot of community organizations that I work with started talking about like, okay, we can't do door-to-door -door canvassing and people are going to be voting by mail. How do we make sure everybody still votes, right? How do we organize? Um, and so they've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, Facebook, with YouTube, um, with peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking, right? Using all these different tools at their disposal to help make sure that, that people are voting and maybe connecting with people on the COVID issue, on the pandemic, like, how's your family doing? Do you have food? Can we connect you with resources? And then integrating into that conversation, hey, you know, you also, we also need to make sure you're registered. Um, and so building a relationship with people based on the pandemic. Zachary, I'm okay. That was my son. Um, <laughs> so the, these organizations are working really hard um, to make it work. Um, and then we also have ongoing experiments. I mean, Nick was talking about the importance of language and reaching out bilingually. Um, I'm doing a lot of experiments this year, following up on some experiments from 2015 and 2016 on um, how to do bilingual and when to do bilingual versus when to do English only, right? Um, and really the kind of micro-targeting that you and I were exploring in that experiment in Texas, Joe, like, or sorry, Los Angeles and then Texas, but like, getting into the micro-targeting and who responds better to a, a call to vote from the Latino voter mobilization project versus the American voter mobilization project, right? Who responds better to an English language message versus a bilingual message? Um, how can we use Spanish language media like radio advertisements, right? So there's a lot of really cool stuff that people are doing. I mean, it's really <laughs> like an ongoing excitement and then um, now what I'm doing with these organizations is we have all these findings from June, July, August from primaries and we're like, okay, quick, now get a bunch of money. So we have to do the fundraising and now quick, go do it for fall. Right. Um, so it's, we are learning and learning and learning as we go. Um, and the research is like this, um, you know, feedback machine, try something, figure out what it meant try something else, figure out what it meant. And then hopefully we've maximized our effectiveness and our efficiency of, of funding so that we can go out next month and, and really get out the vote. So, so it, sounds like, it sounds to me like it's a huge question of resources and what's available and what the, uh, the campaigns have available for them. Uh, yeah. Nick, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the resources. Um, how were you all able to do what you did in Iowa, giving your limited amount of resources and what do you think that the campaigns could have done better there?
Can you repeat the question, Joe? Oh yeah, um, I was, uh, you know, Professor Michelson, right, just uh, finished describing that it all sounds like a question of resources. Um, that there are, there, you know, there are an infinite number of ideas out there for Latino voter mobilization. Um, I'm wondering, you know, given, given the, the finite amount of resources that you had on the ground, um, what do you think could have done better? Could have, you know, could have worked out better for your campaign? Um, I really want to be, I really want our viewers or our audience to get a sense of what it was like there and what you um, was hoping, you know, were hoping could, could go better in, in, that, in that campaign. Yeah, I think um, th there were a few things that could have done better, but you, you're right. There, there are finite resources, uh, which is why we were partnering with a lot of other community groups. So it just wasn't really uh, LULAC led the way, but we were sharing in um, we were sharing mutual resources with each other, whether it be money, uh, volunteers, um, ideas, and, and strategies. That way, we can leverage each other's um, resources and then also um you know meet our goal that that we were trying to reach um a couple things that that probably could have you know we could have done better uh throughout the campaign was um you know having some more support with the camp we had about 20 candidates and campaigns um and i think a lot of it um these campaigns themselves probably could have done a, a lot better to uh, engage with the you know Lat latino uh, centered organizations and um, spend more time to learn about the issues um, instead of just coming around every two to four years um, and to, to make it an ongoing thing that way every two or four years we don't have to um, you know run around looking for money or or other resources thank you for that response um, yeah right so it sounds like um... <laughs> There, there's a finite number of resources and um, you know, we, we are all sort of doing our best to be able to mobilize Latino voters. It definitely is far from ideal. Um, I have a question for you, Melissa. This has to do with um, the Democratic Party um, not canvassing sort of vigorously um, due to COVID-19 um, and much of their outreach is on digital platforms, right? And they are sort of working really hard to reach out to folks, but you know, folks need to have a smartphone and all that stuff. Um, how could campaigns reach out to non-digital Latinx voters? These are folks that obviously don't have a Facebook, you know, can't be micro-targeted in those ways. Yeah, this is actually a question I've been getting a lot from the media, you know, given mm -hmm. that what we found is that door-to-door -door canvassing and face-to-face -face interactions is so effective that, oh no, how can the Biden campaign possibly win if they can't compete with Trump? Um, and I would repeat that, you know, the community organizations, at least the ones that I'm in touch with, uh, they've been working on this, you know, and, and we've had six months now to get ready and to try different things. And um, okay, maybe not everyone has a smartphone and maybe not everybody's on Facebook, but most people have a cell phone, <laughs> you know, um, that's pretty much a given. And so there's friend to friend text banking, right? Um, there's um, these social network experiments, relational organizing that's going on. And, and then I, really the, the same stuff I talked about before, there's letters you can put in the mail, um, there's, there's door drops, there's definitely a lot of digital going on. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of people who aren't connected in some way, right? Uh, everybody knows somebody and so um, one of the things that I'm doing with one of the community organizations is, um, you know, we, we, we get one person and we give them the materials and then they kind of share it, even if it's just with the uh, young adults in their household who aren't registered even or just are registered but don't vote. Um, but if you send them the materials and um, you give them some information that they can share and you create, you know, a buzz about it. Um, you can pretty effectively reach out to people who maybe aren't on Facebook uh, or aren't on Instagram, although, I mean, honestly, most people really are. I don't know if you have some numbers for me that I should know about, but, you know, most young folks, they're on Instagram, they're, they're on Snapchat, like they're out, they're out there in the digital yeah. space, so we can get them. Most older folks, too, I know that my mom just got a Facebook account just so she could look at pictures. Many, yeah. many older people get Facebook accounts just to look at pictures of the grandchildren. And they are being micro-targeted in those ways. <laughs> and, then, and then we can micro-target them. 
Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Do we know if the Trump administration or um, or conservative Republican groups have a similar sort of um, I want to say like 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 a mechanism for mobilizing Latino voters in that way? Um, we have we have reason to believe they do, but um, I know at least uh, my friends who t who work in partisan campaigns mm -hmm. um, are usually pretty strictly muzzled in terms of what they can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, they get paid good money, but they're not allowed to share. It's different from the work I do, which is with nonpartisan community organizations. So I get to publish the stuff that I do, but they can't. Um, similarly, um, I think probably folks who work for the Republican Party aren't really allowed to talk about it so much, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't want to share your secrets with the other side, right? If you're the Democrats, you don't want the Republicans to know and vice versa. So a lot of times when you're working with a partisan organization or a, a partisan campaign, you're, you're sworn to a non-disclosure agreement and you don't, you don't get to share. Um, that said, stuff does, you know, leak out a bit. And I know they, you know, we have Act Blue, they have Go Red or something. Like they, they have their own things, right? Where they're also trying and they're, you know, that Trump has 25% of Latinx vote. That's, they're doing something. Right, even if we can't see what it is that they're doing. Right, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, Billy brought it up at the beginning of the session, I'm wondering how that sort of snuck up on us. And it seems like there has to be a, a, a mechanism, there has to be a process that's happening in the background that we're not seeing, which is amazing. Um, yeah, my following question was about sort of unconventional aspects of um, that we can use to connect to the Latinx community, because we've already talked about some of that. Do you have any additional, any additional aspects to share anything that we might, that we might do to get the Latinx community? Uh, I mean, honestly, there's so many fun things that are being tried, but whenever I make a presentation, I, I like to ask the young people in the audience, like, hey, what have we not done, right? Um, what, what website are you all on that we should be on so that we can reach people who aren't on Facebook because that's really for old people now, right? What, what is the site, right? Um, how can we use TikTok to get out the vote? How can we use um, Reddit to get out the vote. I don't even know. Josh, what's the cool website now? Well, I use Reddit. Reddit. Like, the 15-year-old no says Reddit. Okay. So, you know, like that, that's why we got to keep talking to the teenagers and the young adults because they're the ones who know what the cool new thing is. Don't ask me. I'm old, yeah. right? Maybe some of your students who are in attendance can give exactly. me and Nick some ideas because they're the ones who know. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I, Nick, Nick, on to you. Um, what are some conventional aspects that you all use to get uh, to, to get the Latinx community involved in, in your campaign? Well, um, a lot of our councils did a lot of different things. Uh, one of the main things that we did was holding, I'm pretty sure everybody knows what this is, is, is Loteria, Loteria Night. Um, so one thing that we, we would have Loteria Night and bring the civic engagement aspect into it. We would invite presidential candidates uh, to speak to the community. We would play Loteria. Um, at one event, I think we had uh, uh, Bernie and uh, Julian Castro uh, calling the Loteria cards um, <laughs> just to get uh, the community engaged with the process. And at the same time, they learn about their candidates, uh, yeah. they learn about Caucasin, um, and they're informed w when they go to the polls. Um, another thing that we would do is uh, we, uh, we would go to, um, I don't know if it's unconventional, I, I, think, I think it might be in Iowa, but we would go to just these fiestas um, where the community would be located um, and already engaged. So we, we would, you know, register voters, we would canvas, uh, basically just have an intimate conversations um, with folks on the ground because that's what it's going to take um, to reach out to these folks. Um, one other thing that we did too was, uh, um, you guys just talked about it, was reaching out to older folks. And we, and we made that a priority through uh, making that connection through their, um, their children. So we had a lot of young folks on the ground um, who were very excited and very engaged in the process. Um, and we stressed it, you know, uh, most of the time with, with these uh, younger adults, you know, it's to get their parents involved. Because um, most of the time, uh, my parents and their parents and their grandparents, um, you know, they don't know much about the process. They may not be connected um, digitally. So we just want to make sure that, um, you know, the younger folks are 
bringing in their parents into this process. Um, that way, you know, the whole household can uh, go out and vote. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, that sounds sounds exciting. So it sounds like there was a lot going on. I was teaching my course called uh, Latino Political Behavior um, in the winter. And I was telling my students like, hey, y'all, there's a whole bunch of exciting stuff. I'm seeing on Twitter a whole bunch of exciting stuff happening over in Iowa. You don't know what's going on. We won't know until after the Iowa caucuses occur. And lo and behold, Bernie Sanders wound up winning a large swath of the Latino vote. I think the Latino decisions made an entire blog post about it, describing his victory and, and, and how organizations were instrumental. One of the things that I learned was um, of Bernie Sanders' multi-layered approach, a multi-layered campaign, where he would make, obviously, like, like conventional ad buys, like, like uh, commercials in a, in a news show, or commercials for TV. Um, but he would also um, buy, um, commercials and TV in Spanish language radio and then send mailers out, right? And it, it seemed to be, it seemed like he was, he was attacking the issue from multiple fronts. Um, how did that strategy benefit Latinx voters? Um, did you see that firsthand unfold? Nick? Yes, um, that was the first time that we've ever seen um, that, that tactic uh, being used on the ground. And what that does is you're, you're not just, um, the, the Sanders campaign, and, and we understand at LULAC that uh, we are a diverse uh, community. So um, we have different religions, different cultures, different backgrounds, um, different age groups, and we live in different parts of the state of Iowa. And one of the things, you know, this multi-layer approach didn't just focus on one piece, you know, of this community. Uh, Bernie reached out to everybody even the uh, Latinx conservatives, your independents, um, and your traditional um, Democratic uh, voters. Uh, one, other th one other thing how this benefited the community was they were pouring millions and millions of dollars um, into this process, whether it be radio ads, newspapers, um, and that really does elevate the community because they were reaching out to Latin Latinx vendors. You know, we put this money into our community um, to these vendors and they put it in their community um, mm -hmm. and having that and I think that dynamic itself built a lot of trust with the community because we all know our Latin we all know our Spanish newspapers we all know our Spanish radios um, and then when you hear the candidate on you know on this media um, they build trust with the, the campaigns build trust and the voters get informed about the process. Mm -hmm. One of the last things that I um, that I wanted to ask you about um, ask you about was um, the act of caucusing, right? So, so the, the caucuses are, are different in, in the primary process, the candidate selection process, um, and then as far as uh, political participation activities go, it is a very involved form of political participation. You're not just asking folks to vote; you're asking them to show up, to be in a room uh, in the winter, to run around, you know, indicating their support for other candidates and such. Um, yeah, um, what was involved in getting uh, Latinos out to caucus, and and how um, how is that different from you know the stuff that we've been talking about? Yeah, so the um, in Iowa we have the Iowa caucus, um, and it's basically just a community meeting um, where folks from you know your your district or uh, precinct, you know, to come together and everybody uh, chooses who you know they want as their nominee. It does involve a lot. It, do, it does involve some engagement. Um, a lot of moving around um, and a lot of confusion and, and in some places can be uh, very chaotic. Um, so one of our things, even before we launched our campaign, uh, was working with the Democratic Party uh, to make sure that these caucuses were accessible um, for everybody. And we're talking about language, culture, um, for uh, Latinx uh, community in Iowa. So. One thing that the party proposed, but they shut down uh, right away, um, was we almost had on. Um, we were almost going to be able to phone in our candidate on caucus night, um, just to elevate, you know, increase participation uh, during the caucuses. But they changed it to what they called satellite caucuses, and a satellite caucus is just like a normal caucus, uh, but they can be organized by the community. Um, for whatever the reason may be, it may be for language, it may be for accessibility, um, whatever, or, or you may work on third shift. We had some folks caucusing on third shift. 
Um, and so we, LULAC, seen this as a huge opportunity to petition for these satellite caucuses all across our major communities across the state. And so what we did, we, we, we were able to establish uh, five of these. Um, all of them were all, all Spanish caucuses. So when you walk in, the, the lit was in Spanish, the language was, was in Spanish. Um, our Spanish caucuses also had uh, babysitting services. We also had a kid's room where we play uh, uh, Coco. Um, and we also had uh, carritos playing yeah. in the background with, with some, you know, pan dulce and coffee on the side. Um, and so our, our goal was to just try to make this as comfortable as possible. That way folks know that it's in Spanish and know that they will see their own community um, together. But the challenge was trying to make sure that they knew how to caucus. And so one thing that we, one other thing that we did do was we held about two dozen what we called bilingual um, mock caucuses where we would invite the community and we would have a mock caucus and we would, um, you know, we'd have these different, um, you know, Mexican dishes. You want a caucus for enchiladas, uh, tamales or, or frijoles. Um, mm -hmm. That way, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> that way it's relevant to the community and it really was um, a popular thing that we did. And it made sure that the community saw the process in front of their, you know, in front of themselves, and they can answer any questions um, at these events. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah it, it, it was good. So, and, and what happened was these, when it was actual time to caucus, a lot of these uh, buildings that we um, were caucusing at were just overflowed yeah. with uh, with people eager to vote um, and have their voices heard uh, at the Iowa caucuses. That sounds exhilarating. Um, yeah, but who won? Who oh, won yeah, the it, mock caucus? In um, the, the mock caucuses, uh, I heard tamales was oh, the, the, the hot topic, yes. Okay, that, that's important that, that, information. It sounds like it was a community effort. And, and this is consistent with what uh, Professor Michelson uh, points out, right, that Latinos need to through their own organizations, say it needs to be a community-based effort really to get the community out to vote, to get them involved in the process. Uh, a question that I have for the both of you, and we're sort of running out of time, is um, because we are, you know, here at DePaul University, we're hosting the event. We are sort of focused on the Midwest and you know the Chicago area is, is proximate to several states. Um, what opportunities do Latinos present in the Midwest, um, you know, in relation to the upcoming election? I'm curious to pick your brain about that. Well, many of the Midwest states are the swing states, right? I mean, this, the presidential election is being decided to a large extent in the Midwest. And, you know, because we're so polarized and the margins are expected to be so thin, right? You know, we are all familiar with the very narrow margin in the three uh, Midwest states that gave Trump the presidency. It in a way means that even small groups can be the kingmakers, right? And so, even if when you imagine the Midwest, you think white people, I think there is a greater appreciation now by many people that, hey, there are significant numbers of Latinx folks in these states, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are 200,000 of them in Iowa. How many of them are in Wisconsin? How many of them are in Michigan? So um, they matter, right? Um, and a lot of uh, Senate races and House races also are pretty close and so then again every vote matters and if you can win over that and get out turnout because really it's a turnout game if you can get out the vote among latinos to vote in november that might just be what you need so uh, i think this is part of why we're seeing more and more conversations and more media coverage and more investment in getting out the latinx vote this year because you know it maybe texas is in play but also, there's those thin slivers of Latinos in the Midwest that really could make a huge difference. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to do before proceeding is um, encourage our audience to ask any questions. If there are any students that have any questions about mobilizing the Latino vote, um, here you have you know, two folks that are well-versed in it. Um, so please feel free to ask away. We'll, uh... or, or ideas. Ideas. I Seriously, students have ideas. I'm, I am here for them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, Nick, uh, in terms of opportunities, real quick, you know, give me, give me a brief feel about opportunities that Lulac has identified in the Midwest. Yeah, um, 
And just like what the professor just said, um, you know, these communities um, are small, but they're mighty here, here in the state of Iowa. Um, right now, actually, LULAC, Iowa is in the middle of five different lawsuits um, that are dealing with uh, voter suppression uh, in our state. Um, so, and, and I tell the community, you know, if your vote um, doesn't matter, then why are these guys working overtime to take your vote away? And so that's one part of, of our effort is making sure that um, our right to vote um, isn't being impeded on. And so we are in, in, a, in a lawsuit against the state of Iowa um, for uh, new rules that will make it hard to process an absentee ballot. We, uh, we, uh, uh, Donald Trump um, is suing three different counties in Iowa. We have intervened in all three of those lawsuits. Um, they're trying to toss tens of thousands of ballots and many of these counties are our largest Latino populations. Um, and we're also involved in another lawsuit where uh, there's this huge issue about uh, ballot drop boxes. Mm -hmm. um, something that we've always done in the past. We have drop boxes in our communities, at our churches, uh, and, and our, in our stores. So we are in the middle of a lawsuit uh, about that as well. So the opportunity is huge. You know, Iowa, a lot of these states in the Midwest, uh, our swing states, and they are working as hard as they can uh, to make it hard to vote, especially for the Latino and immigrant communities in Iowa. One one question that I have uh, from a student in the in the chat box, and 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 if you have any questions or suggestions for Professor Michelson on how to mobilize Latinos as well, please drop them in the put them in the drop box there in the chat box. Um, and and this is a bit of an elephant in the room when we talk about Latino politics. Um, how do you appeal to all different constituencies of Latinx? Um, these various constituencies, right? Mexican American, Puerto Rican American, Cuban American, Dominican American, Central American. Um, are there particular issues that motivate all groups within the pan ethnic category? No. <laughs> no, ex except maybe jobs, the economy, yeah. you know, um, healthcare, right? Yeah. Everyone cares about those. But if you're thinking, like, is it immigration or is it bilingual education? Like, no. Right, everyone's got different um, things that are of interest to their community, and um, you know it's going to depend what state you're in, what generation you are, et cetera. Um, but the same things that motivate non-Latinx voters also mobilize Latinx voters. Mm -hmm. Fix the economy, mm -hmm. get me back to work, get me back to get my kids back in school. Um, that matters to everybody. So. Right. This is, again, something I feel like I say all the time, like Latinx, Latinx people are just like other people. They, they care about the same things. Like there's no magical Latinx issue that motivates them. They want a good job. They want a good life for their family. They want to be, be safe. They want to have enough to eat. They want their kids to get a good education. It's just like everybody else. Everyone cares about the same stuff. They'd also like a little less racism, a little less xenophobia. That'd be lovely, but really jobs, healthcare, education. That's what they care about. Yeah, um, I saw a presentation yesterday talking about how COVID-19 is, is a, could be a rallying issue for, for Latinx folks. Um, how Latinxes are, I think, are two to three times more likely to, to fall ill with it. And they're overrepresented in, in pork to farm industries, right? So they're more likely to be service sectors and all that stuff. Um, yeah, yeah um, the institutional racism and the, the, the way in which people are, are segregated in the workforce um, and also just that there's a lot of cultural celebrations that are happening and I mean, at least here in San Mateo County, uh, the local government is really having a challenge of Latinx families continuing to get together um, and to socialize and they're not following the rules, um, which is also contributing to higher rates of infection and, and death and it's, it's very frustrating. Oh, cool. Now we got another question. All right. Uh, real quick, uh, Nick, uh, how do you appeal to different constituencies of Latinx? Right? Uh, did you encounter needing to make these cross-group appeals in your in your campaign? Uh, yeah. So here in Iowa, the major industry is the ag, the agriculture industry, um, and we made appeals. It wasn't necessarily in the campaign. Uh, the caucus, but it was over the summer when COVID-19 hit. Um, a lot of the, uh, 
a, a rallying point for COVID-19, I, I would agree because a lot of the Latinx conservatives um, who a lot are farmers as well here in the state of Iowa, um, we're not pleased with the response of, of COVID-19. What happened was the uh, the virus uh, arrived in Iowa and it decimated uh, our community, especially in communities uh, with the meatpacking workers. We were advocating for these workers all summer. Um, but the thing was, is a lot of these conservatives just realized because what happened was a lot of these plants had to shut down. And so a lot of these conservative Latinxes realized that if we don't protect the workers, um, you know, the farmers aren't gonna, you know, the farmers are gonna have to euthanize their animals. Um, it's gonna impact the consumers um, on the back end. And at the same time, you know, the, these folks who we call essential um, aren't getting the dignity um, and uh, protections that they need. And so that is one, that is, you know, one issue that is appealing to a lot of people across the board um, here in the state of Iowa, but yeah. Uh, there was a question here in the chat box uh, real quick. Um, how would you recommend that we encourage Latinx communities to vote and register to vote in times of COVID? And uh, Professor Michelson here brought up, brought up a great uh, term, uh, relational organizing. Uh, would, you, would you describe that to us, Melissa? Yeah, kind of this is one of the new things that just works amazingly well, right? Um, it's like this old uh, shampoo commercial I remember from when I was little. I told three friends and they told three friends and they told three friends and, and it, the tree grows more and more branches, right? And more and more people know. So you reach out to three to five people and you make sure that they're registered and you tell them um, all about voting and you get each of them to commit to contact five people, right? Mm -hmm. And before you know it, a million people have registered to vote and are signed up for ballot tracking and are gonna make sure that their vote is counted. Mm -hmm. um, and it works because um, then you only have to train five people and mm -hmm. each person then only has to train five people and you can make sure they have all the information they need and they know you and trust you, right? Because you're going to pick five people that are in your social network that are your close friends or family members. And so um, that works because it makes sure that people are getting good information from a trusted source, but it grows exponentially, right? Um, so that's one of these new tools that people are using. And you can do it without being face to face, you know, as much as we all miss each other. Um, you can do it over the phone, you can do it over a, a FaceTime call, um, or even just text messaging, like you can, you can do it safely. And I think as much as I really want everyone to vote, I also don't want people getting sick. I don't want people getting infected. And so I can't recommend door to door canvassing right now. But I can recommend all of these socially distant forms of of mobilizing that really are amazingly effective. Like this relational organizing stuff it is powerful stuff. Um, maybe better than door-to-door -door canvassing where you're knocking on strangers' doors. So um, it's safe, it's effective. Go, go reach out to five people, go do it right now. Uh, and here, uh, I'll share with you the last question that you've got here. Um, how can we mobilize to educate Latinx voters on how the elections work? Many older folks, um, older folks that are registered to vote shy away from it because they don't really understand how the system works. Right, so there's a question of civics education happening here. How, how, um, yeah, I mean, just like Nick was talking about doing these mock caucuses, right? Yeah. That's also something that political scientists have known for a while. Like a lot of people have uh, concerns about, well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna mess up. I don't know how it works. I'm afraid of being challenged, right? What if they ask for my ID? What if I met, you know, do something wrong? I'm gonna get in trouble. Right. Um, and so if you can walk people through it, um, you know, here in California, I got my uh, mock ballot in the mail from my secretary of state. I can go through it and mark it. It looks just like the real thing. Right. And then when the real thing comes in the mail, I can mark it. So have a have a voting party. Get together with people and talk through the candidates. Make sure everybody understands how to fill out their mail in ballot or, you know, what they need to do to make sure they can go to the polls. They have the right ID. Right. Um, we used to be worried that telling people about voter ID would make them more worried about being challenged. Turns out it helps. Right? If you mm -hmm. tell them like, here's what you're going to need. Let's make sure you have that, right? You got that. Now here's where you go and you are ready because you have the correct ID and that helps voter turnout. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like help, help 
your grandparents, you know, <laughs> keep them safe um, and help them fill out their mail-in ballots. And yeah, no, that's, that's also an important part of it. Amazing ideas. And I'm really happy that Nick introduced to us this, this idea of, of the, the caucusing party, like the enchiladas and the tamales and all that. Um, I love it. Is there a way to adapt that in Zoom? I mean, you know, how, how would you recommend to us? Nick? Everything can be on Zoom. <laughs> My yeah. life is Zoom. What do you mean can that be on Zoom? Everything can be on Zoom, Joe. <laughs> Everything is Zoom. Zoom. And any parting shots, Nick? In terms of um, el um, educating our older folks? Yeah, it's just uh, just like what I said is having these mock caucuses. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to be like these mock caucuses, but however your election is being held, uh, wherever you're from, uh, you just want to make sure that these folks are, uh, they walk through that process. And one other big thing that we do is be visible. So when we were doing this work, we were in, we want to make sure that we were in the newspapers, that we were visible uh, on social media uh, and throughout the community. Because when, um, what will happen is a lot of these older folks and, and, and some of these others will, will see us and they will feel, uh, you know, empowered and inspired, um, you know, to exercise their right to vote and have their voices heard. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, and with that said, let's see here, do we have another question? Um, uh, how can you avoid performative activism on social media while using social media platforms to get out the vote? Are there any specific groups that you admire doing a good job in their social media strategy to reach out to Latino voters? Oh, yeah. Is there anyone that we can follow doing, doing this work exceptionally well? I was going to more answer the, the first part of it. Um, I think there is a difference between, you know, ranting about a politician we don't like or, you know, putting in all the hashtags and sharing things on social media that really help, right? Sharing links to where to register, calling out your friends specifically, tag your friends and say, hey, Joe, at Joe, click here to make sure you're still registered. Hey, mm -hmm. Nick, click right here. You know, I, I'm not sure you voted yet, Nick. Have you clicked here to check? Calling out your friends specifically and giving them a link works a lot better than being like, hashtag, hashtag, I'm so awesome and socially justice warrior, right? Mm -hmm. um, so th that's what I would do, right? That kind of links to this idea of like, you're reaching out to people you know. I'm not just tweeting, I'm tagging you and I'm giving you a link. That mm -hmm. works, that works on Facebook for sure. Um, and we're exploring using it on other platforms as well, but it definitely works for Facebook posts. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe Nick has a good answer for the second question. Nick? On perform uh, performative activism? Or any organizations that you think are doing a great job um, at, at this, at mobilizing the Latino vote? Um, I've been following Voto Latino uh, mm -hmm. over the year. Uh, they, they have some pretty good resources and tools on their website. Um, and they and they have a pretty good nonpartisan approach uh, to getting uh, you know Latinos mobilized uh, across the country, especially uh, in our swing states. Um, and I, I think another group that I would recommend is uh, uh, it's more of an activism group, but it's uh, Mi Gente, um, and it's uh, it's a little different, but they focus on more issues oriented. So folks who are engaged in the process but want to learn about the issues um, <clears throat> can go on there and I think as, as far as social media and, and sharing that information um, is always important uh, just but just remember that you know you're you're in your own little space with your own friends um, on some of these platforms and to always you know um, take it out on the streets as well because a lot of this stuff that's happening um, on social media, a lot of the normal average Joes um, don't really understand or, or follow in what's going on. So I think a, a, a hybrid of, of social media and, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, face -face relational org organizing uh, will work. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with, with that, I, we, we do need to stop here. We have gone over, <laughs> over, about, over our program for about five minutes. Um, I'd like to thank the both of you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending from the bottom of my heart on what we've learned today. Hopefully that all of you can take this home. Um, can, hopefully that all of you find this content relevant to um, our understanding of this pivotal constituency ahead of the election. 
um, yeah, thank you very much for showing up. And um, I look forward to having these amazing conversations with you, my students in class. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Melissa and Nick for showing up. I appreciate your expertise. Thanks and for thank having me. Center for Latino Research uh, for sponsoring this event. All right. Go vote, right. everybody. Good day, everyone. Bye now. Bye.